This is Brother Peter Diamond, VaticanCatholic.com. What is the chance that life could have arisen randomly, by itself, on the early Earth? The chance can actually be calculated, and it's stunning to consider. It's a fact that life cannot exist or function without proteins. Proteins exist within the cell. Proteins are required for the structure, function, and regulation of the body. They are essential components of muscles, skin, bones, and the body as a whole. Proteins are made up of chains of amino acids, and the amino acids in the chain must be in the proper order or sequential arrangement for the protein to form. If the amino acids are not in the correct order or sequential arrangement, a protein will not fold into the proper three-dimensional shape that is necessary for it to function. The protein will not be built and life will not exist. Now, if we were to consider, for the sake of argument, the chance that an amino acid compound could have formed into a protein by itself on the early earth, what would the chance of that happening be? Let's pretend that a prebiotic soup existed and that this soup contained the necessary conditions and components required for an amino acid chain to form randomly on its own. Of course, this is not realistic or scientific for to say that something came into existence out of nothing violates the law of causality. Moreover, the assumed early condition of the earth would not have been conducive to the constituent parts of the cell arising and surviving on their own. The assumed condition of the earth would have been hostile to it. Nevertheless, for the sake of argument, let's suppose that a chain of amino acids could have formed by chance into a protein. Let's assume that this could happen in order to analyze the chance that it would happen. The 100,000 kinds of proteins in the body are comprised of 20 different kinds of amino acids in various combinations. Since only 20 kinds of amino acids form proteins, the probability of even a small chain of amino acids forming randomly into a protein can be calculated. A short protein is about 150 amino acids long. But for the sake of understanding this point, let's first consider a hypothetical chain that is two amino acids long. If you had a two amino acid chain, the number of possible combinations in the chain would be 20 to the second power, or 20 times 20 for a total of 400 possible combinations. That's because there would be 20 possible amino acids in the first spot of the chain and 20 possible amino acids in the second spot, resulting in 20 times 20, or 400. In a 3 amino acid chain, the number of possible combinations would be 20 to the third power for a total of 8,000, because you would have 20 possibilities in each spot of the chain. In a 4 amino acid chain, it would be 20 to the fourth power for a total of 160,000 possibilities. Now, there is no such thing as a protein with two or four amino acids. A short protein has about 150 amino acids. The number of possible combinations in a 150 amino acid chain would be 20 to the 150th power. That is, 20 different possibilities in every spot of the chain. That number is roughly equivalent to 10 to the 195th power. To get an idea of just how large a number 10 to the 195th power is, consider that the total number of atoms in the observable universe is believed to be about 10 to the 80th power. For some perspective on this, consider that each grain of sand contains many millions of atoms. Therefore, to say that the total number of atoms in the universe dwarfs the total number of grains of sand in the world would be a major understatement. And the total number of possible combinations in a 150 amino acid chain dwarfs the total number of atoms estimated to exist in the observable universe. That means that even if one presupposed that all of the constituent parts necessary to build a functional protein existed on their own, something that's not realistic or scientific, a small chain of 150 amino acids, which must be in a precise order for a functional protein to form, would represent only one possible sequence 
out of 10 to the 195th power total possible sequences. In his book Signature in the Cell, Dr. Stephen Meyer presents the exhaustive scientific case for the information-bearing properties of DNA. He also covers the unimaginably small probability that amino acids would randomly form into a protein. He consults mathematicians and researchers. He also allows for the possibility that amino acid chains accept some duplication or variation in the sequencing. He cites researcher Douglas Axe and points out that even if we accept some variation, an educated estimate for the possibility of a random process stumbling upon a functional protein sequence is 1 in 10 to the 74th power. That is, it would happen one time in every 10 to the 74th power attempts. The number of atoms in our galaxy is believed to be 10 to the 65th power. It's difficult to express just how small that chance would be, but you could redefine it as zero. And remember, even if one protein were somehow to form, you are nowhere near a living cell. Stephen C. Meyer, Signature in the Cell, pages 210 to 211. Quote, I wanted to know the odds of finding any functional protein whatsoever within such a space. That number would make it possible to evaluate chance-based origin-of-life scenarios to assess the probability that a single protein, any working protein, would have arisen by chance on the early Earth. Fortunately, Axe's work provided this number as well. Axe knew that in nature proteins perform many specific functions. He also knew that in order to perform these functions, their amino acid chains must first fold into stable three-dimensional structures. He first performed experiments that enabled him to estimate the frequency of sequences that will produce stable folds. On the basis of his experimental results, he calculated the ratio of A, the number of 150 amino acid sequences capable of folding into stable function-ready structures, to B, the whole set of possible amino acid sequences of that length. He determined that ratio to be 1 to 10 to the 74th power. In other words, a random process producing amino acid chains of this length would stumble onto a functional protein only about once in every 10 to the 74th power attempts. In conversations with me, Axe has compared the odds of producing a functional protein sequence of modest 150 amino acid length at random to the odds of finding a single marked atom out of all the atoms in our galaxy via a blind and undirected search. Believe it or not, the odds of finding the marked atom in our galaxy are markedly better, about a billion times better, than those of finding a functional protein among all the sequences of corresponding length. End quote. And the problem for chance is even worse than that. That's because these calculations dealt with the possibility of stumbling onto a functional sequence, and even if you had the correct sequence or order of amino acids, for a protein to form, you would still need only left-handed amino acids in every spot of the chain. Scientists explain that every amino acid found in proteins has a left-handed and a right-handed version. Working proteins only accept left-handed amino acids. Thus, the possibility that each amino acid along the 150 amino acid chain would be left-handed is one chance in 10 to the 45th power. Moreover, peptide bonds would also be required to link each amino acid with the next one in the chain. In experiments with amino acids, it has been discovered that peptide bonds only form about half of the time. Thus, the chance that every amino acid in the chain would have a peptide bond is also one chance in 10 to the 45th power. Taking all of these facts into account, Meyer concludes, quote, Axe's improved estimate of how rare functional proteins are within sequence space has now made it possible to calculate the probability that a 150 amino acid compound assembled by random interactions in a prebiotic soup would be a functional protein. This calculation can be made by multiplying the three independent probabilities by one another. The probability of incorporating only peptide bonds, 1 in 10 to the 45th power. 
the probability of incorporating only left-handed amino acids, 1 in 10 to the 45th power, and the probability of achieving correct amino acid sequencing using AXE's 1 in 10 to the 74th power estimate. Making that calculation, multiplying the separate probabilities by adding their exponents, gives a dramatic answer. The odds of getting even one functional protein of modest 150 amino acids by chance from a prebiotic soup is no better than one chance in 10 to the 164th power. It is almost impossible to convey what this number represents, but let me try. Consider that there are only 10 to the 80th power protons, neutrons, and electrons in the observable universe. Thus, if the odds of finding a functional protein by chance on the first attempt had been 1 in 10 to the 80th power, we would have said that's like finding a marked particle among all the particles in the universe, a much larger haystack. Unfortunately, the problem is much worse than that. With odds standing at one chance in 10 to the 164th power of finding a functional protein among the possible 150 amino acid compounds, the probability is 84 orders of magnitude, or powers of 10, smaller than the probability of finding the marked particle in the whole universe. Another way to say that is the probability of finding a functional protein by chance alone is a trillion, 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 trillion times smaller than the odds of finding a single specified particle among all the particles in the universe. And the problem is even worse than this for at least two reasons. First, Axe's experiments calculated the odds of finding even a relatively short protein by chance alone. More typical proteins have hundreds of amino acids and in many cases their function requires close association with other protein chains. For example, the typical RNA polymerase has over 3,000 functionally specified amino acids. The probability of producing such a protein, and many other necessary proteins by chance, would be far smaller than the odds of producing a 150 amino acid protein. Second, as discussed, a minimally complex cell would require many more proteins than just one. Taking this into account only causes the improbability of generating the necessary proteins by chance or the genetic information to produce them to balloon beyond comprehension. If we assume that a minimally complex cell needs at least 250 proteins of, on average, 150 amino acids, and that the probability of producing just one such protein is 1 in 10 to the 164th power multiplied by itself 250 times, then it would be 1 in 10 to the 41,000th power. End quote. Stephen Meyer, Signature in the Cell, pages 211 to 213. Therefore, even if one assumed that the constituent parts of a small protein were somehow able to come into existence out of nothing and then survive on their own, something that's totally unscientific and unrealistic. There is absolutely no chance that a functional protein, or the many other proteins required for a minimally complex cell, would form randomly. A functional protein would also require a system of other proteins and molecular machines for it to perform its role. So that prompts the question, what accounts for the precise and improbable arrangement of all the amino acids and proteins? Which improbable arrangement is necessary in each case for life to function? The answer is DNA. DNA contains the instructions for life. DNA actually contains information and a code. Perhaps you've heard something like that before. But what does it mean? Explanations of how DNA contains information and a code are often complex and sophisticated. After hearing them, many are left without a meaningful understanding of the issue. In this video, I hope to explain in simple terms what is so special about DNA, how DNA contains information, why this fact is of colossal significance, and points to something bigger. Let's begin by asking, why do the offspring of living things resemble their parents? What do living things contain that enables them to reproduce? For a long time, this was an unresolved question in biology. 
Many unrealistic ideas about how it occurred were advanced. One idea was that creatures contained replicas of themselves within their reproductive systems. However, in the 19th century, scientists began to realize that the answer resided somewhere within the cell. As Stephen C. Meyer explains in his book Signature in the Cell, page 61, quote, scientists began to notice that the transmission of hereditary traits seemed to occur in accord with some predictable patterns. The work of Gregor Mendel in the 1860s was particularly important in this regard. Mendel studied the humble garden pea. He knew that some pea plants have green seeds, while some have yellow. When he crossed green peas with yellow peas, the second generation peas always had yellow peas. If Mendel had stopped there, he might have assumed that the capacity for making green seeds in the next generation had been lost. But Mendel didn't stop there. He crossed the crosses. Each of these parent plants had yellow seeds, but their offspring had 75% yellow seeds and 25% green. Apparently the first generation of crossed seeds, the all yellow batch, nevertheless had something for making green seeds tucked away inside of them, waiting to emerge in a subsequent generation given the right circumstances. End quote. Even though the yellow seeds appeared, a capacity resided within the yellow seeds for making green seeds. It was later confirmed that this hidden capacity or information to produce green seeds came from DNA. DNA is a molecule that's found within the cell. It has a captivating double helix structure. It looks like a twisted ladder. DNA is packed and stacked on an amazingly small scale within chromosomes in the cell. A human being has 23 pairs of chromosomes, which contain DNA, for a total of 46. DNA is so small that 6 feet of DNA can fit into the nucleus of each cell in our body. To get an idea of how small one nucleus is, 10,000 nuclei could fit on the tip of a needle. That means that when we're talking about DNA and the information it contains, we're talking about an intricacy of function and sophistication on a breathtakingly minute scale. DNA, which stands for deoxyribonucleic acid, contains the genetic instructions for the development and function of all known living organisms. It contains the information the cell uses to build all the proteins in the body. And, as it was covered earlier, proteins are necessary for life to function. So exactly how does DNA contain and express information? How does it transmit the information necessary to build proteins? What does all of that mean? That's what we need to discuss. In this picture, you can see that the double helix structure of the DNA molecule looks like a ladder that has been twisted. The genetic key to DNA is found in the steps of the staircase, if you will, the nitrogen-containing bases. Each segment of DNA contains a sugar, a phosphate group, and a base. Together they form what's called a nucleotide. It's the DNA bases, the steps of the ladder, if you will, on which we must focus. There are four types of chemicals that make up the four different bases in DNA. They are adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. They are represented by the letters A, T, C, G. The precise arrangement of these chemicals allows all life to function. If these chemicals are not arranged in the correct order, there will be no life. Here's why. Proteins are made up of chains of amino acids, as we discussed, and the amino acids which form proteins must be in the proper order or sequential arrangement for the protein to form. If the amino acids are not in the correct order, a protein will not fold into the proper three-dimensional shape that is necessary for it to function the protein will not be built. So the amino acids must be in the proper order or sequence for a protein to be built and for life to exist. It has also been discovered that the highly improbable order of amino acids in chains, which is necessary for life to function, comes from a prior specific order or sequential arrangement of the bases in DNA, the chemicals on the steps of the DNA ladder. In other words, if the chemical bases in DNA, A, T, C, and G, which run up and down the DNA molecule, are not in the proper order, 
then amino acids will not link up in the proper sequence and proteins will not be built. Stephen C. Meyer, Signature in the Cell, pages 100 to 102, quote, The sequence hypothesis suggested that the nucleotide bases in DNA functioned just like alphabetic letters in an English text or binary digits in software or a machine code. According to Crick's hypothesis, it is the precise arrangement or sequence of these bases that determines the arrangement of amino acids, which in turn determines protein folding and structure. In other words, the sequence specificity of amino acids in proteins derives from a prior specificity of arrangement in the nucleotide bases on the DNA molecule. By the early 1960s, scientists had developed many techniques for studying the effects of changes in DNA sequences on proteins. These techniques enabled scientists to establish a definitive link between base sequences in DNA and the sequences of amino acids. Experiments using such techniques eventually revealed a set of correspondences between specific groups of bases and individual amino acids. These correspondences came to be called the genetic code. End quote. Here's how it works. Please bear with me as I very quickly attempt to explain this, for possessing a basic understanding of this matter is necessary to recognize how DNA contains information and constitutes a code. In DNA, you have the double-stranded structure of the molecule, as we saw. Now suppose that running up one strand, you have the bases A, C, T, G. In other words, adenine, cytosine, thymine, and then guanine. Well, in DNA, the chemical A, or adenine, always pairs with T, thymine, and C, cytosine, always pairs with G, guanine. That means that when you have the order or arrangement of ACTG, for example, on one strand, right across from it on the other strand of the double helix, running in the other direction, you will have TGAC, because adenine is always across from thymine, and guanine is always across from cytosine. The chemical bases in DNA come in many different orders, but in whatever order you have, adenine is always paired with thymine, and guanine with cytosine. Now, the formation of a protein involves a process called transcription. During this process, the DNA molecule, which has a double-stranded structure, is unzipped. The two strands are separated. In this image, you can see the dotted lines which show the hydrogen bonds between adenine and thymine. In DNA transcription, the hydrogen bonds are broken, allowing the double helix to unzip. By the way, when DNA is unzipped and the two strands are separated, a protein is necessary to unzip it. But proteins are only formed from DNA. This demonstrates that both proteins and DNA must have existed simultaneously from the beginning, but more on that in a bit. So, when the DNA molecule we are talking about is unzipped, the bases of ACTG will be left exposed on a single strand of DNA. DNA contains millions of base sequences, but we will just consider this simple sequence of four as an example. So, when DNA is unzipped and the two strands are separated, then an enzyme called RNA polymerase will make a copy of one of the exposed strands of DNA, called the template strand. But it will make a copy in a complementary form, called mRNA, or messenger RNA. What happens is that free-floating nucleotides, similar to the components of DNA, are joined in a molecule called mRNA, or messenger RNA. This mRNA molecule matches up with the exposed DNA strand, so that if the mRNA molecule is matching with the nucleotide base G for guanine, the mRNA will have a C in that place, since C always pairs with G. The only difference between DNA and mRNA is that mRNA uses a slightly different coding system. DNA uses ATCG for adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine, but mRNA uses U in the place of T. mRNA uses U for uracil instead of T for thymine, so that its coding system is AUCG instead of ATCG. That means that when mRNA matches up with the single strand of DNA, and when it matches with A or adenine, it won't have a T as in DNA. It will have a U for uracil. 
When the process of base pairing is completed, that is, when the messenger RNA has made a complementary copy of the DNA template strand, then the mRNA molecule will break away as the DNA strands rejoin. The mRNA will then leave the nucleus and enter the cytoplasm. When the mRNA has left the nucleus, a protein called a ribosome will come along. This protein will grab the mRNA molecule. It is here where we move from the process called DNA transcription to the process called DNA translation. When the ribosome has the mRNA molecule in its grasp, so to speak, another molecule approaches called tRNA or transfer RNA. This is an extremely important part. Attached to the top of the transfer RNA molecule is an amino acid. Each transfer RNA recognizes only one amino acid. That's shown at the top of this image. At the bottom of the transfer RNA are three bases. These three bases pair up with three bases on the mRNA transcript we just discussed. You can see that in the images. What happens is that when the mRNA strand has the base sequence AUG, adenine uracil guanine, then the transfer RNA with the complementary bases at the bottom and the specific amino acid which links with those bases will pair up with the appropriate base pairs on the mRNA. In this case, UAC on the tRNA will match with the sequence AUG on the mRNA because A is complementary to U, etc. Since the tRNA molecule has only three bases, as we see here, the coding or matching that it does in DNA translation occurs in sets of three, as we see in these images. Three base sequences, therefore, wind up expressing one amino acid. The three bases that do this on the mRNA, shown on the bottom, are called a codon. The three bases on the tRNA that pair with the codon on the mRNA are called an anticodon. In the example we're looking at, the codon would be AUG and the anticodon would be UAC. Once the first codon and anticodon pair up, then the mRNA slides along the ribosome to the next codon, and another tRNA molecule comes along with its specific amino acid at the top, and it matches the complementary bases to the next set of three bases on mRNA. The two amino acids at the top then become joined by a peptide bond, and the transfer RNA molecule is then released by the mRNA. The process continues until a chain of amino acids is formed. So what we have here is an actual code in which sets of three bases equate to or express a particular amino acid. There is a code and there is information. Information is an improbable arrangement or a sequence that produces a specific effect. And this information or improbable arrangement which produces a specific effect must be distinguished from a sequence that is highly improbable but produces no effect. For example, certain evolutionists will argue that even though the order of amino acids and proteins is astronomically improbable when compared to the total number of possible sequences, you could also drop decks of cards on the floor and arrive at card sequences that are extremely improbable in terms of the total number of card sequences that could have come up when the cards were spilled. But that argument is invalid and fallacious because the improbable arrangement of cards that resulted after they were spilled on the floor does not contain specified information. The sequence of cards that resulted from the spill produces no effect. It's worthless. The improbable order or arrangement of amino acids and proteins, on the other hand, does contain information because the order is arranged to produce a specific effect. It results in and is necessary for function in the cell. This is called specified complexity. This type of specified complexity or information only comes from intelligence. In this particular example, the bases AUG on the mRNA link up with and express a specific amino acid. The amino acid expressed by AUG is called methionine. There are actually tables that show which codons, or sets of three bases on mRNA, express which amino acids. 
The base sequence GCA, for example, expresses the amino acid alanine. So this amino acid chain would be methionine and then alanine. Now remember, the amino acids must wind up in precisely the correct order for a protein to form and for life to exist. If you get the wrong order, there is no life. As stated earlier, a relatively short protein would be comprised of about 150 amino acids in precisely the correct order. Many proteins require thousands of properly sequenced amino acids. Think about that. That means that when the bases in the DNA molecule on the double helix are formed, since the arrangement of those bases will determine what amino acids are eventually expressed, those bases must be formed in view of eventually down the line correctly expressing every three base codon that will link up with every amino acid and the DNA bases must express them in precisely the correct order or there will be no life. And here's what's most important on this point. The linking of codons or three base sequences with specific amino acids is not determined by physical properties or by chemical reactions. As Stephen C. Meyer explains in Signature in the Cell, pages 129 to 130, quote, there is nothing about the chemical properties of the bases in DNA or those in mRNA that favors a chemical bond with any specific amino acid over another. The amino acid and the codon-anticodon pairs are at opposite ends of the tRNA molecule. This distance ensures that neither the codons on the mRNA nor the anticodons on tRNA interact with the amino acids. As Crick anticipated, direct chemical reactions between bases, codons, and amino acids do not determine the assignments that constitute the genetic code. End quote. In other words, and this is extremely important to understand, chemical reactions do not determine that GCA will link up with the amino acid alanine. Notice the distance that exists between GCA, its anticodon pair CGU, and the amino acid expressed by GCA. They are at opposite ends of tRNA. That means that chemical reactions between the codon GCA and the amino acid it expresses, alanine, cannot account for their assignment. No, there is something else that determines the assignment, something that transcends the chemical properties of these things. This is also true of the arrangement of the bases on the DNA molecule. Why are the bases in DNA arranged in the precise orders which enable them to achieve functional sequence? The orders in which they are arranged are highly improbable. What accounts for it? Is it a result of chemical attraction? No, it's not. One cannot logically argue that chemical bonds between the bases in DNA determine their proper sequencing or account for the unique arrangement we see in DNA. That argument will not work because there are no bonds at all between the four bases on the longitudinal north-south axis of the DNA molecule. Following this quote, I will attempt to put into simple terms why this is so significant. Quote, there in the classroom, this elementary fact of DNA chemistry leaped out at me. I realized that explaining DNA's information-rich sequences by appealing to differential chemical bonding affinities meant that there had to be chemical bonds of differing strength between the different bases along the information-bearing axis of the DNA molecule. Yet, as it turns out, there are no differential bonding affinities. There are no bonds at all between the critical information-bearing bases in DNA. There are no significant differential affinities between any of the four bases and the binding sites along the sugar phosphate backbone. Instead, the same type of chemical bond, an N-glycosidic bond, occurs between the base and the backbone regardless of which base attaches. All four bases are acceptable. None is chemically favored. This meant there was nothing about either the backbone of the molecule or the way any of the four bases attached to it that made any sequence more likely to form than another. Later I found that the noted origin of life biochemist Bernd Olaf Coopers had concluded much the same thing. End quote. Meyer, Signature in the Cell, pages 243 to 244. What he's saying is the following. 
If we look at this picture, focus on the second set of bases on the left side, A, C, G, and T. Those four bases are across from T, G, C, A. Now, as we look at these bases, notice that there are bonds running horizontally between A and T, and between C and G. These horizontal bonds link adenine and thymine, and cytosine and guanine. But notice that as we look vertically, or longitudinally, north-south, there are no bonds at all between A and C, and C and G, and G and T, etc. Since there aren't any bonds along this critical information-bearing axis of the molecule, north and south, chemical reactions cannot explain why A would be followed by C, and C followed by G, etc. In the extremely improbable and non-repeating order we find in DNA. Since there aren't any bonds there, one could not say that guanine is chemically more likely to follow cytosine, etc. No, something else is arranging the order, and the proper order must be achieved for life to exist and function. Moreover, if we look again at the letters A, C, G, T, notice how each letter or chemical attaches to the backbone of the molecule itself. The same type of bond occurs with all four chemicals. There is no difference. The same type of bond exists between the base and the backbone, regardless of which base attaches. When A links to the molecule, or when C, G, or T does, the same bond is present. There is no reason, therefore, chemically speaking, why one order of chemicals would form rather than another. All orders are chemically equivalent. Chemical properties, therefore, do not account for the unique, specific, and highly improbable arrangement of the bases in DNA. Something else accounts for it. Meyer makes an excellent analogy when he points out that if you look at a newspaper and you consider the articles it contains, you can explain by way of chemical properties how ink bonds to paper. However, that does not explain why and how the words on the paper are arranged in a meaningful way to communicate information, to give a headline that people will understand. The arrangement of the letters in the newspaper in a meaningful way to achieve a specific effect is only explained by intelligence, an intelligence that arranged them that way, an intelligence that transcends the material media of ink and paper is necessary to arrange the letters in a way that communicates a specific message. The same is true of DNA. The arrangement of the bases in DNA and the arrangement of the amino acids and proteins cannot be explained by chemical properties or chemical reactions. No, intelligence, and since we're talking about design on a level that surpasses anything humans could approach, a supreme intelligence is the only explanation for why the bases in DNA and the amino acids and proteins are arranged in a way that transcends the materials involved to achieve specific effects. For what we have in every single protein, is an extremely improbable arrangement of amino acids. It's more improbable than finding a single marked atom via a blind search out of all the atoms in the galaxy. This arrangement comes from a prior extremely improbable arrangement of the nucleotide bases in DNA. These extremely improbable arrangements are all organized to produce a specific effect, and that's the definition of information. In man's repeated and testable experience, which is what science is supposed to utilize, information only comes from intelligence. For example, if people are listening for radio signals and they only hear repetitive static, they do not consider that to be evidence of intelligence or information. They must listen for something else. But if they receive a series of sounds or signals that are out of the ordinary, improbable, conform to a recognized pattern, or achieve a specific effect, they understand those signals to be information and the evidence of intelligence. Based on every scientific and rational consideration, DNA, functional amino acid chains, and proteins prove that a surpassing intelligence designed the information processing systems in the cell. It can also be demonstrated that DNA and proteins were created simultaneously when we consider the following. 
We discussed how the arrangement of the bases in DNA constitutes the code for the arrangement of amino acids in a chain, which arrangement is necessary to form a protein. That means that for a protein to form, you must have DNA. All right, but for DNA to be copied and transcribed, which is part of the process of forming a protein, you must have proteins. Think about that. It means that if you had DNA without proteins, you could never get to proteins or life because DNA requires proteins to become proteins. And you could never start with proteins, that is, have proteins without DNA, because proteins only come from a specific arrangement of the bases in DNA. This proves that one could not have evolved into the other over time. They were created simultaneously. An excellent example of this point is RNA polymerase, one of the protein enzymes involved in DNA transcription. RNA polymerase is, as I mentioned, what makes an mRNA version of one of the DNA strands. This must be done for DNA to form a protein. So DNA does not become a protein without the protein, RNA polymerase. But RNA polymerase is only formed from the prior specific arrangement of the bases in DNA. There is an irreducible complexity. They must have been created at the same time. It's also interesting that the hydrogen bonds which link the base pairs in DNA are not strong individually, but when they are linked up in the double helix, they provide great stability. They are sort of like a zipper. One link is not especially strong, but when zipped up, the chain becomes stable. This marvelous design gives DNA both the flexibility to unwind in replication and the strength to stay together it bears the marks of a brilliant creation. Indeed, when forming DNA and its billions of bases, the one who arranged it knew that the precise order of bases laid down would determine the precise order of complementary bases on mRNA. He also knew that these complementary bases on mRNA would in turn signal the precise three base codes or codons each of which would match up with a complementary three-base anticodon on tRNA. He knew that when each of these codons matched up with a precise amino acid, that the amino acids must be picked in the right order out of an astronomically large number of other possible orders if life was to exist and function. In other words, when he laid down the bases in DNA, he knew that following the processes of DNA transcription and translation, the final sequence of amino acids expressed and signaled by those bases was exactly the sequence he was looking for. And all of this is determined, formed, and executed on a scale so small that no unaided human eye can see it and no human hand can approach the unimaginable dexterity with which it has been arranged. Quote, but now, O Lord, you are our father, we are the clay, and you are our potter, and all of us are the work of your hand. Isaiah 64, 8 God, he is higher than heaven, and what wilt thou do? He is deeper than hell, and how wilt thou know? The measure of him is longer than the earth, and broader than the sea. Job 11, 7-10 In charting the genetic code, it has been proven that specific three base sequences or codons represent actual commands to start and stop amino acid chains. For example, when the bases AUG line up on the mRNA transcript, it represents a start codon. It starts the chain of amino acids, just like you would start a message with DEER or a computer program with RUN. The ribosome will continue to add the amino acids coded on the mRNA transcript until it reaches a stop codon. Stop codons are represented by three base codes that literally signal the end of an amino acid chain, just like you would end a message with the word sincerely or a computer program with the command end. Examples of these stop codons are UGA and TAG. The whole process is akin to a supercomputer program, with start and stop commands programmed at the appropriate places. 
However, DNA is a computer program and language that operates on a level of sophistication and design that far exceeds anything human beings have ever produced. As the founder of Microsoft, Bill Gates, remarked, quote, Human DNA is like a computer program, but far, far more advanced than any software ever created, end quote. DNA is so complex that we've only begun to understand how it works. Certain regions of DNA code for other regions. They do this in ways we do not fully understand. Also, sections of DNA called introns, which some evolutionists previously believed were useless sections of junk DNA, have now been discovered, and this should be no surprise to the believer, to play important functional roles in the cell. Yet, as far as most evolutionists are concerned, if the purpose of some portion of DNA is not immediately apparent, in their blindness and pride, they wrongly conclude that it is useless. They think in this way despite the fact that their puny intelligence and limited understanding does not afford them even a small idea of DNA's total function and capability. The truth is that what man considers to be a mistake in the design of the cell is actually another example of what man does not yet understand. Until the 1950s, scientists had literally no idea what was going on in the cell. They believed that the cell was a simple blob-like substance. Over the last few decades, a world of microscopic information, organization, and machinery has been uncovered within the tiniest recesses of the body. Despite these marvelous findings, which should give all scientific researchers pause. If anything at all in this amazing world of design does not immediately strike their finite minds as making complete and perfect sense, they insolently chalk up the problem to DNA, rather than, as they should, to their own inadequate understanding. Fools despise wisdom. Proverbs 1.7 Charles Darwin, the man who came up with the theory of evolution, admitted, quote, If it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed, which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. End quote. Darwin, Origin of Species, 6th edition, 1988, page 154. Not only do such complex systems exist in many creatures, they exist in every cell. As we saw, Proteins cannot exist without the information in DNA, and DNA cannot become proteins without proteins. And proteins are useless without the other proteins, molecular machines, and factories which work in unison in the cell. Proteins thus could not have been formed by successive slight modifications, and DNA could not have become proteins without already functional proteins. All of it had to be and was created simultaneously. Darwin's quote theory is thus completely refuted. When Darwin published his quote theory, he literally had no idea what the cell really was or what was occurring within it. His quote theory is actually nothing more than an elaborate fairy tale which could only have been adopted by a spiritually darkened generation. DNA contains specified information, a code, machines, and processes on a scale of nanotechnology that the most capable designers in the world could only dream about achieving. Scientific experience teaches that such information, codes, messages, computer languages, only comes from an intelligent designer. Since we are talking about information and intelligence in all living things, DNA and the cell are proof of a supremely intelligent creator. God created DNA and all of the extraordinary processes that go with it in the cell, and he did so all at once. It is not an accident that at the very time man began to understand computer technology and successfully design computer programs, man also learned that more advanced forms of these systems existed in each person. Yet the systems within the cell were designed to be so small that unaided human eyes would not find them. They were hidden, tucked away, only to be revealed when modern man thought he had achieved surpassing knowledge and understanding. 
In addition to the obvious role in life's function, the design in the cell was God's reminder to man that whatever he thinks he has discovered, God knew it all along and in an infinitely greater way.